Um, we have a special presentation. We had Shadow Spirit Echo. And we have Chief Saluka. And we have Warrior River Wild. And I'm assuming, is he with you? We're all at the same village. He's Mountain Wolf Clan Mother. I am Mountain Wolf Clan Mother of the Northeastern Timberland Nation. This is part of my village. This is my chief. This is my warrior. And this is my grandson, Maverick Lone Wolf. Your grandson. Okay, he's not on the list. Yet. I know. We welcome you tonight. We're Thank glad you. that you can come and share this information for us. And we'll turn the meeting over to you. Oh, one thing I forgot. We do always start um, the meetings with the Pledge of Allegiance. So we can do that. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Ms. Aldrich. <coughs>
play this song because in the 1700s, Amazing Grace became the Cherokee anthem. To this day, Amazing Grace is the Cherokee anthem. Wishta, which means greeting in the native tongue. Tonight I brought this. Not that I needed to. It is called a talking stick. And when we are in council, you know we adults just love to socialize. But when someone has a talking stick, you can't talk. If you're caught talking, you get your respect. Now, I'm going to give a little bit of my family history, and there's some history here that you already know, but in order for me to get my point across to you, I'm going to repeat it. But first, I'm going to start with me. I was born and raised in Madisonville, right outside of Moscow, and I lived on a 97 and a half acre farm. We were the only house on this land. We rotated crops every year, as well as putting certain fields aside for the animals to eat. It kept our crops safe for our farm. I'm a farmer's daughter. My father was a member of the Sons of the Pioneers. My mother was Shoshone, Dutch German. My father was Blackfoot and German. There is no difference between Blackfoot and Blackfeet. Only Blackfeet is federally recognized. Excuse me. My fourth great grandfather was Shoshone, and he prophesied that every th three generations, a set of twins would be born. I am an identical twin. He, to supplement his income, he made jewelry. This is a replica of what he made. For my twin and I, he never met. He made a copper bracelet, turquoise stone, ring, and a necklace for the next set of twins to be born. Look what I just did. Which was this. <laughs> I am clanned by inheritance. I am shadow spirit echo. Mountain wolf clan mother to the Northeastern Timberland nation. I was blessed by having five grandmothers. Two regular two great, and one great great. They shared many stories with me, but one particular story I was told was when my great-grandmother was traveling from the west here in, co in the covered wagon, her 13-year-old sister ran away and married a Shoshone. She was automatically disowned. Being native is not a religion, it's a way of life. At a young age, we are taught prayer. To this day, before your feet hit the floor, we look to the east. We give thanks to Wankintaka, creator, for bringing me through the night into the light. And I give thanks for life is a gift. The Shoshone called themselves Nibi, which means person. Now the Native American beliefs are deeply rooted in their culture. We believe everything is sacred, from the largest mountains to the smallest plant and animal. A lesson can be found in all things and experience in everything. It has a purpose. To sum up the native spirituality, it's about honor, love, and respect. Not only do we love, honor, and respect our Creator and our Mother Earth, but also every living thing. It's about being in touch with ourselves and everything around us. It's about knowing and understanding that we are part of everything and everything is a part of us. We are all one. We also believe our, believe our elders hold the answers. This is why I'm here tonight. All my elders have passed away. Our elders keep our culture alive. We have much to learn from our elders, and they deserve and receive our utmost respect. Native American isn't about blood. It's what's in the heart the love for the land, the respect for it, those who inhabit it, the respect and acknowledgement of the spirits. The Indians loved to worship from birth to death. He reverenced his surroundings. He considered himself born in the luxurious lap of Mother Earth. And no place to him was humble. 
There was nothing between him and the big holy Wakintaka creator. The contact was immediate and personal, and the blessing of Wakintaka followed, flowed over the Indian like rain. Wakintaka was not aloof, apart, or ever seeking to quail evil forces. He did not punish the animals or the birds, and likewise, he did not punish man. He was not a punishing God, for there was never a question as to the supremacy of an evil power over and above the power of good. There was but one ruling power, and that was good. Now in the beginning, it is believed that from 30 to 60,000 years ago, during the Ice Age, the Native American descended from Alaska and Siberia to here. It took years, and they came in small groups. Now their dress of our ancestors was skins and pelts. All skins were brain tanned, and the women did all this as well as decorate their clothing. Of course, when white man first saw this, they called our people savages. Now the native homes here in Pennsylvania, well, the soil was, you know, the, Pennsylvania is so rich in soil and trees and animals. During the summer, they lived in teepees. During the winter, they made huts. The huts were made of bark, moss, and mud for the logs. The floor was made of split logs. From 1600 through the 1800s, their weapons were knife, warhawk, bow and arrow, spears, and axes. And later, the repeating rifle known as the Henry at a later date. The United States military used the tomahawk during the Vietnam War during black ops. Some weapons women used as gardening tools. As I said earlier, from 1600 to the late 1800s, Pennsylvania was very rich in fertile soil, fur, forest, and game. Native Americans used what is called the three sisters, corn, bean, and squash. Women stored seeds for the next year's crop. During this time, the warriors fought and hunted, fought other tribes for the rich land that Pennsylvania had as well as game. Everything was done for the good of all people in their village. Women did all the work, from putting up teepees, making clothing, cooking, etc. Shoshones did not spank their children. They would look at a child and scold them. They believed spanking a child would make that child evil later in life. Everhart Museum. There are lots of artifacts from our area there. Now there's a dugout coo canoe that was found in the Roaring Brook in Hollisterville. When a native died, they would take their dead and wrap them in skins and pelts. And they would tie them to the canoe and put the canoe upright on a tree. And then they would tie their dead there. The village would move far away. They would come back after one year with the horse and their dog, kill them, put everything on fire, and reduce it to ash. They felt that if they stayed too close to the dead, that they would confuse the dead and it would turn into a bad spirit. Natives believed the spirit of the dead would remain at a burial site for four days. So not to confuse the deceased spirit, they moved. If they stayed at a burial site, they believed the spirit would be evil. Evil because they are no longer human. Native cemeteries are sacred. If you leave a footprint on a grave, a bad spirit will follow you, your generations, until atonement was made. When I was walking through the wilderness, I came across a, a boulder. It was a big boulder. And beside it was four logs that evidently grew into trees. This was a burial site. Now here, this is in Madisonville, the native would be placed high up close to Creator. They too were wrapped in skins and pelts. And again, the village would move far away, but never come back. Time took its place for the deceased. The hollow boulder was an oven. Natives would put grandfathers in the fire. Grandfathers used in this text are rocks. 
after the rocks are heated, they will put them in, bake, or boil their produce. A little further, I found four columns of rocks neatly stacked like a square. This was a sign of direction for the Native American. This land is landlocked. A very tiny mound was at the base of a tree. Dr. Joseph Intelisano said, this is a baby. I tobaccoed, prayed, and left, and I did not go back. Very close to this spot is a swamp. I found arrowheads. This proved to me my ancestors lived here. As I started, stated earlier, Native fought Native until the Pale Prophet, the Peacekeeper, came. The Peacekeeper spoke Algonquin. In the Algonquin language, you can speak 17 languages. Peace was made with the tribes in Pennsylvania. The Algonquin was subservient to the Iroquois. Sage and cedar is sacred even to this day. Sage and cedar would be placed in a smudge bowl. This is an original smudge bowl. It's very old, okay? We would place our tobacco, our sage, and then we would smudge. By doing this, we are purifying ourselves and the area from any evil because we're about to go into a sacred ceremony, prayer, whatever. Now, I'm going to recite a prayer <coughs> that is breaking all traditional Native rules. But like I said, my elders are gone. My Native father, Chief Night Eagle, died two weeks ago. And I've got to go ahead on this. They would smudge smoke from their head to their toe. Usually a shaman would do this. As the smoke rises, you would bring the smoke to your head for good thoughts. No anger, jealousy, or hate. To the ears, to see the world around to see the world around you in a good way. That's the eyes. Throat, speak kindness, and in a non-judgmental way. Ears, listen to each other instead of waiting to speak. Heart, feel connected to all human beings in a loving way. Underfoot, this way the dark side of your soul, the world, will not follow in your footsteps. This prayer is said silently, never to be spoken out loud. This ends the smudgy prayer. This practice is done today. So when you go to, well, the, the powwows no, no longer smudge at the beginning. You have to smudge and camp yourselves. I'm going to talk about my favorite tree here now. Now in Pennsylvania, <coughs> there were many, many, many trees that once was here. It rained so hard it hurt. I said, Uncle. I'm so cold. And he said, follow me, little one. He took me to a hemlock tree, reached up and broke down the twigs. And with one match, we had a very good fire in a horrible rainstorm. Ceremony still continued through the rain. Many trees were used for medicine, but I'm sticking to the hemlock. The inner bark of the hemlock was boiled and used for boils, fever, diuretic, mosquito bites. Early spring, you know, at the end of your pine tree, see a little green? Well, they would pick that, boil it, and use it as a tea. They would also use the tray for tools and cooking implements. Now, my great-grandmother gave us all warnings. Twice a year, panthers would cross from Madisonville to Mount Cobb, which in Mount Cobb's time was very important. I did not believe this. My mother was in the hospital. At 11 p.m., the doctor called and needed to speak to my father. I saddled my horse and proceeded down the laneway. My horse started to act differently. My horse was snorting and going faster and faster. It was a very bright night. Suddenly, I heard a horrible growl, a quick look. It was a black panther on the stone wall. My horse reared up and off we ran. 
When I got to the three-acre field where my father and brother were, I gave him the message the doctor then told him about the panther. At that moment, I wished I was anybody but me. Oh, how my father tore me apart. You were told not to go through the laneway, but to cut through the woods, because it is that time of year for the crossing of the panthers. My great-grandmother had concerns about Mount Cobb, which possessed panthers and mountain lions. I'm a believer now. Mount Cobb was a meeting place for the Native Americans. The pioneers were here, and there was a lot of bloodshed. The natives would prepare a fire for smoke signals. Every Indian knew when to look up. The smoke would tell them whether to stay or run. Warrior Run is justly named. Many wor warriors used this path to kill the white man. My grandmother's name is Freema Ann Taylor. She was raised up in a cabin in the wilderness of what's known today as Taylor. One day, Uncle Jimmy walked to the store about two miles. On his way home, he noticed a mountain lion following him home. He ran so quick to that cabin and slammed that door. That mountain lion circled the cabin for two hours before it left. A lesson well learned. Jessup Mountain. When driving down Jessup Mountain, you could see winding roads blocked off by boulders and logs. In its time, it was called Snake Mountain because of its winding road. The pioneers, as well as the Indians, traveled this road. The pioneers, did want the, oh, the pioneers didn't want their wagons to speed down the mountain. It would mean the loss of wagon, horse, and even life. The natives traveled this road as well, and when coming upon white men, they would kill them. Just take a moment and think about the Jessup Mountain, where those logs and those boulders are. That was all trees, beautiful trees that are forever gone. Thornhurst. I can't explain a better nightmare than Thornhurst. The best example that I could give anybody about Pennsylvania looked like two to three hundred years ago is Thornhurst. You could drive miles and miles through the forest, and when you get to a totem pole, you would know exactly where you are. If you don't see the totem pole, you are very well maybe lost. The Allenhurst Boulevard. Now, my great-grandmother would hitch up her buckboard and go to Scranton to sell her produce. And the first road in Scranton was Lackawanna Avenue because of the railroad, but also people would come in from outside the area to sell their produce. My grandmother had already buried six children and her husband, and this is how she supplemented her income. She hated it. It was a dirt road. Her buggy would sink. Yeah, she had words. And the first street in Scranton was Lackawanna. Now Archibald. Archibald was named White Oak Run, naturally because of white oaks. Run means any body of water with a current. Lackawanna River runs through Archibald. Its original name was Lenape for Lechita Hika, meaning the river that forks. Archibald is the seventh largest borough in Pennsylvania. 1846, it was named after James Archibald. Everywhere there is a river, Indians would live. It is said that if you dig two to three hundred feet down into the sediment, you will find native treasures. Native Americans, legend and lore. All traditional, all traditional Native Americans told stories to their children. And they would pass these stories down from generation to generation and so on to keep history alive. Now I was told about a legend of the lost gold in Archibald at the 40 foot falls. In a cave. As the legend goes, the British paid the Native American one million dollars in gold to terrorize the settlers, which were Welsh, Irish, and German. During this period of time, White Oak Run had one percent Native American, reduced to zero population. Why are there no natives in Archibald? The Native American was sold as a slave.
This is why. As I was told by an elder, the British dressed up like the Native Americans. They terrorized the settlers and they kept the gold. Pennsylvania is steeped with lost gold and silver. One legend states that Daniel Boone, who at the time lived in Lancaster, he was a man of the wilderness and he hated Indians. One day while traveling through the wilderness, which led here to here, he became hungry and he saw a little hole. And, and like he was looking for a mountain lion, a bear, anything to eat. So he pulled himself through the hole. When he got inside, he seen silver. Silver on the top, on the sides. So much silver that it puddled on the floor of the cave. He left to go get tools. And on his way back, he couldn't find the cave. To this day, that cave has never been found. Hmm. Could it be in one of the many caves here in Archibald? I don't know. Or has the elements of time taken its place? I was told there is a house in all of it that is well over 100 years old. Down deep in its dirt basement is an untold amount of gold stolen from the stagecoach. I hear now there's a concrete on the floor of the basement in this house. Now, I was down in Lancaster and I went to a stone quarry, just to be nosy, okay? And there was a five gallon pail at the entrance and I thought, hmm, let me look in here. And I did. What I found was rocks with tiny lines of gold in the rock. And I said, hey, I want that. I was told, there's not enough gold there for you to take. Leave it. I did. Now, my faith does not include material things. My treasure is creator himself. I know some of you here are here to hear about the lost treasures. To find lost treasures, think like an Indian. All rivers can tr contain treasures. After a flood, walk the riverbanks with a close eye look. You may find something. Look inside trees, under ledges, boulders, caves, stone walls, untouched farmland, like fields if a farmer's plowing. You have to go, go check when he's done plowing. You might be surprised. Now, mounds. I humbly ask, please respect our mounds that hold our dead. White man took away our right to care for our dead. The mound represents a pregnant woman. For from Mother Earth we come, to Mother Earth we go. From spirit we come, to spirit we go. If you step on a mound, you are cursed until proper atonement is made. In Archibald, there's a huge mound in the forest, and I mean huge. The larger the mound tells how great that person or entire village was. Right off of Archibald Mountain, there is a cemetery. <coughs> Somewhere along the stone wall, there is a native mother who died while giving birth. Her and her child were buried by the stone wall, and the problem is nobody knows which side she's in. It, it's not touched. Is this true? I don't know. This is what I was told. Pennsylvania does not recognize the Native American, yet on top of our capital is a Native American statue. The last tribe to be recognized as a federal nation is the Shinnecock tribe on Long Island, New York. They became recognized October 1st, 2012. Pennsylvania Native Americans who live on the Lackawanna River <laughs> left went to the Delaware and stayed there. They were Lenape. Here we go. I love this part. Frequent questions asked. No, I do not live in a teepee. I camp in one. Why is there fire in a circle? Fire is believed to be part of the sun. The sun represents the pale prophet. Fire is sacred. The drum calls people together, warns of da danger, also used to dance for creator in the calling of spirits. The circle, called the circle of life, for each one of us are a strand of life. We enter in from the east gate because this is where the new world will come, and the pale prophet, the teacher. Now, women carry.
carry blankets. Why? Well, <coughs> it's considered the blanket of life. We carry our babies, the wood, the berries, you know, everything the men didn't do, we did on the blanket. But the most important part was when the white man and the Indian were fighting and the women went to go collect up their dead, they took their blanket. And if their warrior was alive, they laid the blanket over the warrior, then took him back to their village and nursed him back to health. This is the original meaning of why Native women carry blankets. What is sacred to natives? Tobacco, cedar sage, sweet grass. In the Old Testament it is said, you do not offer me up any sweet smelling senses. Tobacco and cedar is a gift to creator, as well as a purification. Also sweet grass, Mother Earth's hair. Prayer ties. This is a tradition a traditional prayer tie. Inside it, I have tobacco and sage. What's special about this is it's tied and wound seven times and then tied off. Why? North, south, east, west. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Burn it, bury it, or hang it. When you say your prayer, you have to turn around, walk away, Forget your prayer. Just like when God said to Lot, don't look back to his wife, and she turned into a pillar of salt. If you turn back to look at your prayer tie, you're telling Creator, you don't trust that he will answer your prayer. How did children who were remote, removed from their parents by the white man know if other children from their village was with them? Every child was taught a lullaby from the day they were born. And the name of that lullaby was called Little Bear. So when the little ones would hear another one from way over humming that tune, they knew a brother or sister was close by. Did Native women torture prisoners? Oh, yes, they did. They would take the prisoner and tie him to a wooden stake, and they would sharpen up their, their long sticks, and they would jab them, okay? And they would just keep poking him and torturing him. Before he could take his last breath, they put him on fire. And under that, how did the Iroquois husband punish his wife? If she was out of control. He would pull a toenail out. How did Native Americans learn medicine? In 1650, the lost tribes of ancient Israel, after exile of 1290, met up with what I believe to be my ancestors. The pale prophet, the teacher, came and taught the medicine of Mother Earth. What is the Iroquois Confederate Six Federal Nation? Iroquois, Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Mohawk, and Tuscarora. Now, there's a difference between tribal and intertribal. When somebody says tribal, it's everybody. When it's intertribal, it is only you and you and your nation. You would dance the way your village would dance. But at a powwow, we have tribal and intertribal. Like I said, tribal is for all nations. Inner tribal's one. Oh boy, I'm making a mess up here. Cherokee tear dress. When the women were taken, they were not allowed to wear their leather. And so this is what they were allowed to make. They were not allowed scissors, knives, or anything like that. Everything had to be torn. 
This dress is a nightmare to make, and I made it. What caught me so much was, if you look under the armpit, it's a V instead of the way we sew today. They didn't know, nobody taught them. Ribbons are very important. When the native went to the white man and he said, can we have leather lace? Which is French. And the white man didn't care for that. He said, no. Brothers and sisters went back and talked. Can we have ribbon? Yes. So each nation took a color. This is a Shoshone Cherokee tear dress. My colors are black, blue, and red. This is a Blackfoot ribbon shirt. You know your brothers by its colors. Over here, we have Cherokee and Apache. He wears all his colors. And we're not the Hell Angels, but that's how we tell each other apart, by our colors. <coughs> now, don't touch a native's hair, unless you are the wife, the husband, the chief, or the clan mother. It is said that if you touch somebody's hair, you are automatically married to them. This is a medicine bag. No one is allowed to touch it, for what it holds inside holds my heart. Some people go for the turtle shell. Now in the back, they would put their leather, and this would become a medicine bag or it would become a medicine rattle. And that's how that went. Loincloths. The longer the loincloth, the holier the person. A young boy will start off with his cloth to be about here. As he grows, it will grow a little longer and then maybe two just above the knee. Anything beyond the knee is a holy man, a very sacred man. Now, the little girls will dance 365 days in order to acquire a jingle dress. I don't know if any of you have ever tapped trees for sap, but back in the day they were like silver uh, metal. And the jingle dress kind of like looks like that. So when the child will dance, <coughs> after she has 365 jingles on her, she is now a medicine woman. We have trade blankets, which are a lot of fun. You put down what you think is worthy of passing on and wait for someone else. And if they take it, you say good trade. If not, you tell them go away. <coughs> when a man throws his hatchet on the floor, it means war. There's a fight coming. Now the Native Americans were the ones who invented chess. Up here we have an original copy of the first chessboard that the Native American made. We have chiefs, clan mothers, horses, wolves, teepees. And you know, if you want to learn how to play chess, Try a native chess set because you know you know the chief's important, you know the clan mother's important, and you know the horse is important, and, and, and you'll understand quickly how the game is played. This is what the original looked like. Cornmeal, uh, women. Cornmeal is very sacred. Yellow represent women, wealth, and abundance. White cornmeal represents the rebirth into the spirit world. Blue cornmeal is spiritual importance. It represents the eastern rising sun, the beginning of life, wisdom, and understanding. White buffalo calf woman came to us from the spirit world. And with her, she bought blue corn. Now because she came from the spirit world, the two warriors were standing there and they said, 
And the one warrior went up and touched her, and he turned to ash. The other warrior said, uh-uh, no way. And the white buffalo calf woman said, do not be afraid. I come from the spirit world to give you a message. When the first white buffalo is born, know then that the new world will start taking its place. Within the last 14, 15 years, a white buffalo was born on the Buffalo Ranch. I think, oh, where is that? Down by Lancaster, isn't it? Oh. Yes. But before that, the very first white buffalo born was in Texas. Our brothers and sisters are preparing now for the time of the new world. There was also a brown and white one brown spot which looks like a feather in the center of his head was born right in the area that I'm from around Sweet Valley, Pennsylvania. Well, okay, now your area is there, my area is yeah. here. Okay, shut up. <laughs> 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 the delusion of a cheese. How do you get rid of cheese? <laughs> You're only the chief. <laughs> How do you get rid of a chief? I'll tell you. <laughs> Rape, theft, and murder. That would be the delusion of the chief. Shamans are holy men and full of faith. They spend all the time meditating, praying. They do absolutely no work. <laughs> now, the last traditional Indian that was seen in Pennsylvania, and I had the date wrong up in uh, Jefferson Historical Society, was about 200 years ago. And on this property, it's a beautiful little creek that comes through, and on the back is a huge mound. And on this little creek here, the natives would camp in the summertime, and then they would move on. There have been so many artifacts on this property that this table here cannot hold what grandma, grandpa, great grandma, or great grandpa dug up and they kept. And like I said, this is nothing compared to what I have seen up in Jefferson Township. There's a ledge there too, and it juts out over the mountains, and it's huge. It's very big. And the natives will come up there, and we always dance in a circle. And if you watch the women when they dance, their footwork is all supposed to be the same, like a cloud formation. Now, they danced up on this rock, this, this huge ledge, and slowly they started disappearing. It was about 150 to 175 years ago. One Indian came back, danced on the rock, left out a cry, and he never came back. And that ledge is there to this day. Now, I'm Shoshone, and my sister, her daughter, was tragically killed in a car accident at age 15. How do we comfort the living when our babies die? We do a pahakne. A pahakne is a circle wound in leather. Stone, twig, personal items on the side, prayer ties, and, and the date, the name, and what have you. The mother or the father would place this in the middle of the grave and they would go and hold on to the hoop. And the spirit of their deceased child would come through the hoop and their spirit would go and they would meet with their child. And so much comfort came from that. To this day, I still use a pahakne, but if you go and remove a pahakne off of a grave, you will be cursed, and so will your generations, for only a mother and a father can touch this. Now, I have a sister-in-law that don't like me, and I don't like her. And I had a pahakne in my mother's grave. She took it and threw it in the woods. Today, she has no teeth, half her jaw is gone, 
She has no idea what she did. None. I'm not going to take the curse off her. Mm -mm. I'm going to put my hot right back. I'm good. <laughs> Now, for those of you who really like plants and what have you, in 1739, William Bartram traveled from the south, documenting all the plant life, all the way up here through Pennsylvania. And I was very happy to see the rhododendron. But the plants that he has in this book no longer exist. They no longer grow only very few. We were loaded with mountain lions, panthers, elk, wolves, anything you could possibly na name. Pennsylvania possessed industry to go over. They left, but the bears stayed. Now before I end my presentation, I'd like to end with a story I feel is very important and I would like everybody to hear it. It's a story about two wolves. There was a grandfather, and he looked down at his grandson, and he said, son, I got a terrible fight going on inside. Well, grandfather, what's wrong? Oh, it's two wolves. Well, grandfather, what's going on? They're fighting. Well, what kind of wolves are they, grandfather? One's a good wolf. He's loving, kind, he's gentle, and the other one's a very bad wolf. He wants to kill me, and, and he's jealous and mean and hated, hateful. And the grandson looked at his grandfather, and he said, Grandfather, which wolf won? And the grandfather said, the one you feed. Ashian, which is Shoshone. Thank you for walking with me. This ends my presentation. I would like you to give a warm welcome to Chief Saluka of the Northeastern Timberland Nation, so you can hear what life is like on his mountain. <laughs> oh, whoa, I have one more thing to do. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say it. I can't say it. There are two kinds of blankets. Your life blanket. When your daughter is born, she will be given a blanket with many fringe. And then she will dance like a butterfly in a circle. And she will just go and go. When courting, she would go like this. I'm going to use you as my boyfriend. And she would dance, you know. And when the drum stopped, say I want to disband. I dropped my blanket. Either he accepts me or he doesn't. Oh. That's how girls do it. My chief, Saluka. <laughs> They call me Saluka, which means warrior with many children. I've raised many of my own, many of others. I have raised them in this country, countries I've fought in around the world. And I've come back each time to my Timberland, my Eastern Timberland life, ways of life, which were in the mountains with the animals, the trees, which are all sky, brothers and sisters, everything, the rocks, the animals, the birds that fly, the water that crosses under our feet. And I've taught these children many, many things as a chief. One, again, chief's job isn't real, real hard because our women do do most of the work. My job is to make sure that the village runs correctly, 
that the children are brought up in the way that they should be. Uh, I have to be in touch with my warriors at all times. There'll never be a decision made without clan mothers, council, and my warriors. I will make the final decision at that point. And from that point in time, we will either what we're going to do, whether we're going to teach, whether we're going to move on from our village due to whatever, you know, death, danger, whatever it could be. Uh, and our area here, like we said, in the Northeast, we didn't speak a lot of Buffalo much or anything like that in the North and East. We spoke more of the white tailed deer we hunted, told stories. Again, the cougar, the panther, the bobcat, the owl. The owl speaks of danger and death. The hawk speaks of a warrior. Eagle, the eagle takes place and stands with his chief. He travels with his chief usually. He'll, he'll bring you luck. He'll bring you message from above. He'll tell you good from bad. He'll tell you <coughs> whether there's danger coming or your seasons will be a good harvest and a good hunt. But like I said, basically as a chief, my job is to secure my village of any danger. I have the final word of my warriors, my clan mothers, my grandmothers, grandfathers. And like I said, basically my job <laughs> as this chief is final say. If I feel that a warrior has dishonored his tribe, he'll be stripped of everything other than his knife and sent out into the, the wilderness. Due to the, what he could have done, it could take up to a year the tribe and clan mothers and grandmothers decided that he couldn't come back. He may not ever come back. But the area, now we'll get into the area where I'm from, down around Harvey's Lake area. Along the rivers there so far within the last years, they have found pottery along the Susquehanna. Uh, Lake Silkworth and Lake Jean have both found village sites along the both of them on top of the mountains within the last few years they've ex excavated up. Um, just, I was saying, just the other night they were doing some excavating and found, as they were they were excavating to put in a new home. They were landscaping and moved a giant boulder. And underneath the boulder, they found, they believe it was probably a Spaniard soldier or something like that, with shield and armor, but surrounding him were native artifacts. So apparently, you know, they came through this point in time to trade or work with the natives in some point. This was just found uh, within the last couple of months. It was, it, it, when they moved the boulder, the, the ground was just starting to thaw. Uh, like I said, different uh, native pottery was found. Um, our style of weapons were found in along with the body and there was even questions of a native 
burial being with this a woman and they thought that maybe he had taken her for a wife and during a raid or something like that might have been killed they're, they're still like I said excavating the sites now and this is uh, up around like I said in the Harvey's Lake area I live below Lake Jean now my property I live on is a winter hunting camp where they would come down off the higher parts of the mountain into where there wasn't so much snow, so the snow went over top of them. And it gave them, it was easier access. They lived in small caves along the side of the mountain for days at a time where they hunted. You know, there, there was um, a lot of bear trail, uh, Lot, you know, a lot of deer trail. On my property alone, we have, I don't know, I guess about 13 or 14 fire pits where there was to been, you know, where the village, the native village sat, the winter village sat. A big prayer circle probably would fit in the middle of this room. And we still, to this day, you can sit there in the summertime hear a drum play and this just does not come from me and my family and friends this is neighbors people who live right next door they'll come to me and say were your friends over playing the drum again <laughs> and I'll kind of laugh and say no my grandmothers and grandfathers were playing for me <clears throat> you know it's it's funny because like I said they say there was no Native Americans in Pennsylvania. But there's so many places where if you take the few minutes of time and go and investigate, I probably have in the area of my house, or must be, I could probably take you to 25 or 30 of burial grounds. I went to Washington a few years ago and protested the putting in of a new highway up there, which ended up being the lower part of 118 and Route 11, because there were so many burial mounds and stuff down there that they were just running them over with bulldozers and stuff like that. And bad things started happening down there. They had uh, mine cave-ins along the highways down there. People just didn't want to believe what it was that they finally rerouted the highway down there where Route 11 and 118 and everything comes in down by the courthouse down there. But back to again, the chief. Basically, again, my job is to take care of my tribe. I have the last word. And in war, when it's time to go to war, I'll be the one that leads my warriors hand in hand to the end. So my job is just as easy as it is hard at the very end. And when I say that, I mean even now as a chief. <coughs> I would go to war for my land and my country at any time and expect any of my brothers to do the same. And as a chief, we believe that our children should carry on these ways. We have to learn and keep teaching them, and like we are here just speaking in little bits at a time, in ways that they understand. Take the time to sit and show them, as well as your own children and grandchildren, to sit and talk to them, to teach them right from wrong, how, how to make a pie, how to make a dress, how to make clothes. Time's going to come again. I really think you're going to need to do this. Because, like you said, your sister has said, the white buffalo has been born and ways will change again. You'll have to hunt for yourself and teach yourself everything you need to survive. And that's again where your chiefs, your warriors,
warriors will come in with her now, your military men, and take over that position. But I would just like to say, as a chief, I thank you all for letting us come in, speak with you, and hope we can do so again at a later time bring more of our people when we have time. And I thank you. I tried to set up a demonstration table for you. Back in the day, a native would paint his feather. It would be war, marriage, whatever, okay? Today they don't do that anymore. This is what they're doing. An 85-year-old Native American man painted this turkey feather. I'm honored. Peace pipes, how are they made? <coughs> this is a deer antler with this stick in it here. Now, I don't have it decorated because I carry the disease that natives die of, sickle cell. My children will get this. One of them will decorate it and claim it as theirs. We love music. This is an original wooden Navajo flute. The only difference between this flute and the real one is this part here is loose. It would go up and down to change the pitch. Beautiful to hear this play in the dark of night to Amazing Grace when you're sleeping in your tent. My drama I had to put to sleep. She started cracking, so she's sleeping. Tom Toms have meanings, all right? This would be the main one. We Boom, for that big sound, okay? Because usually when you go boom, you go down. This, this one means we're tired. Our dance, Tom Toms. This you'll notice is very dirty. This has fur on it. When we pray, we want a soft sound. And we, we are repetitious in our prayers. We continue to say the same thing over and over. And we just softly drum. See these feathers? That's a claw on it. So now this makes it very special to me. This is my smudging, my smudging um, feather. And because my smudge bowl has a hole in it, I now use this. It is acceptable. It is a clay pot, handmade and hand decorated. Now we talk about the rich resources here in Pennsylvania. This is in Pennsylvania. All you got to do is look. Quartz. This is considered a rose quart, and this was taken out of the Waverly Mountains. I was honored with a big bag of them, which I dispersed. This is coral. It's very old, she's falling apart. What the natives would do is they would take the coral to scrape their leathers, all right? As they are rain tanning, this wouldn't rip it. It's kind of like a sandpaper, and it worked awesome. You will find many different kinds of stones all through Pennsylvania. This is pretty special to an old lady. It's considered a rose quart in the making. Everybody has to have a prayer stone, an angry stone, a stone that will hold all your emotions. This is mine. This came out of a river here in Pennsylvania. And again, another quartz in the making. We like to be warm in the winter. 
after our pets have served us well, they continue to serve us as they keep us warm. This is a real gray wolf. Warrior River Wild has a headdress on. That is a real wolf. Please turn around. This is glass beads, and it's all handmade. <coughs> this is a northern Sasita rattle. It's a buffalo horn rattle. You can tell what it is by its colors. Northern Sasista is North Cheyenne. This is a buffalo horn. And it's handmade too. I use this in the circle at night when I'm dancing, praying, singing. This is a capote. Most of the Native Americans wore them. Well, it's a blanket. Long head, long uh, tail on the head, which you wrap around when it's really cold. These are quite warm. Uh, this winter, we actually, we actually sweat in these because it, it's so warm. I told my granddaughters I needed a, a new purse. So they went fishing. God bless their little hearts. They brought me home this. And then, of course, Grandma had to make something. All women wear a knife. This is an antler knife, which I wear here. But I have it out to show. It's very sharp, and it works. Now, there's a secret to animal horns. I had a medicine knife one time, and it was a very big one. It was gifted to me, and I, I have a terrible backache, all right? So I decided to go into the TP and lay down. And the knife was on my back like this. Well, wouldn't you know it, the bone heated up. And that heat went into my back. It was wonderful. I danced all afternoon. Wow. <laughs> this is a woman's knife. You want to show them what a man's knife looks like? <laughs> wow. And he wears it with pride, too. It, too, is short. <laughs> it was our honor, it was our pleasure to give you a part of traditional history that is going to be forever lost unless people like chief, like the warrior, like I the grandmother. We need to step up and stand out. We need to speak. We're here. We're real. Listen to us. The children do not want to hear the creation stories. They want to hear the stories of the Lucaru. And the Lucaru is really like a werewolf story, but you know, and I won't get that, but they want to hear horror stories. They don't want to hear the stories of respect manners, not to be afraid, to be proud, to stand tall, admit when you're wrong. It's not what you put in your mouth, it's what comes out. This ends the traditional Northeastern tribal Native American Timberling Nation. A whole. May we say a prayer, please. Brothers and sisters, great spirit, grandmothers and grandfathers, thank you for the friends that we've made here today. Watch them as they travel to their homes and lodges. Keep them safe in their travels, them and their families. As they can be friends with us, we befriend them. So watch over and guide them on their way. Amen. And a hope. A hope. Thank you. Thank you. sharing with us, part of our job as a historical society is to preserve the history 
for all of the people of the region. And with you coming with us and being with us tonight, that's one more that we're going to be able to share. I was wondering, uh, would you entertain questions from the audience? Absolutely. Anyone have any questions? Yes. Who? I, I have a question for the young man sitting down. <laughs> I, I was wondering what the brush plate uh, signifies. The brush plate was mainly designed to stop the for protection. It was basically like a, a, an arm Shield from arm. arrows. Uh, they're mainly made of <coughs> bone, but they're also all made of wood. basically coming down from where to the Mohawk and the Iroquois. I know an Abenaki yeah. Indian, and he said that we were nicer to the Indians than the French. The f well, the French, mm -hmm. the real, real French were very, very nice. The, the mostly traders. Uh, they they would they would just kill the Indians just for what they had to, to trade off more. But you, your average people, they would try to help you through there as much as they could. They would hide you, and, you know, and stuff like that. But like I said, it was mostly your your French traders and slave traders and stuff like that who would steal the young Indians. Difference between us and reservations. Oh, okay. Us and reservations. Reservations actually are the ones that they caught. Okay. They are the ones that they caught and wound up, you know, taking to different areas. And that's why groups like us are so many different nations. Blackfoot, you know, Uruguay, Shawnee, Pawnee, you know, that's why in in a radius of probably you've got two reservations or three reservations in New York now that are open reservations, but again, they're still, they're all not Onondaga or, you know, there, there are split. The main village is on and dot. But when they were rounding everybody up, taking them to reservations, they were split. You know, and that's why I, yeah, I know people now in Rosebud Reservation that are out of Florida. Wow. And have been there. Their family's grown there since. Uh, since Carlisle School, Carlisle. you know, the beginning of Carlisle School. Now my great grandfather had was one was released from Carlisle School and became a Christian minister in Williamsport. As the Depression came through and work was bad out this way and stuff through up this way down through Williamsport, they traveled in towards the bigger cities more, which I spent most of my time as a child in Philadelphia, where there was more work factories where they could go. But even at that time in the 40s and 50s, my grandfather would very rarely tell anybody that he's Native American. It was always, you know, I'm German or I'm this or I'm that or, or whatever, because when they 
found out he was a Native American, they wouldn't hire him. As oh. well as like the Irish. We were all, my father's people were treated almost like he was black. They looked the, 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 the minimum wage job for nothing, you know, just to keep their families going and stuff like that. And that went on all the way into the late 60s. Native American couldn't own property. No. That's well, why a lot of Native Americans changed their names to a white man's name. name. Because they were not allowed to own any type of property. That or they would marry the a white person. Or they would marry a white person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was up to the 60s, too. Yeah. I think the Canadians uh, have a deep respect for the Native American Indians that moved north, like the Algonquin, Algonquin. Right. and the Ojibwe. Right. <coughs> Because I used to go up fishing. My uncle and I used to go up every year fishing. Yeah. Up in Quebec. Right. And we were in a place called Verandry Park. And we met several Algonquin Indians there. And we met, you know, and I think there was a Ojibwe, if I'm not mistaken, we met there. And the young lady touched on the languages spoken by the Cherokee. The Algonquin, you can speak 17 languages out of the Algonquin <clears throat> language. Right. But, but up in Canada, the point I was trying to say is the Canadians have a deep respect for the Indians because they don't have to have a fishing license. They don't have to have a hunting license. Or they didn't when I was going there. It might have changed. But my uncle said these people can fish wherever they want, they can hunt wherever they want. He's got a wolf in his pocket. A lot of things is a lot of the Native Americans got along with the people. It's the governments that the Native Americans don't get along with because the government forces their ideas and their way of life on the Native American. Most of the settlers that came to this country, the Native Americans, were more than happy to help them out. If it wasn't for the Native Americans, the first people in Johnstown would have never survived the winters. Right. And like I said, we have no problem with the people. It's the government and the way they run their rules and that. Well, the Canadian government even now, where they've opened up to Native Americans like New York, Canada, uh, you understand now, you know, they own quite a bit of that property now. Uh, they have casinos, hotels, you know, the San, especially the Seneca and the Oneida. Yeah. All, they're all big landowners now, you know, big big money people. Yeah, how long ago they were fighting because the United States wanted them to pay wanted, taxes. That's right, because they wanted them to pay taxes. <coughs> and even to this day, listen to last night's television, they're telling you, they'll bring you in from another country at the snap of a finger to open up a business buy you a home, buy you a car, no federal income tax for the first seven years you were here. You think you do that for the Native Americans? We're still on our own fight for any little thing we get. Yeah, New York's trying to get more business in there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How do you get selected or elected to be a chief, and do you remain that way until you die? I will remain that way until I die, because I'm the last, oldest living male. When, it, when that leaves me, it will, if my brother is still alive, it will go to him. If not, it will be my son, because he would be the next oldest in line. Uh, I, and why I say that, I did, my brother has cancer real bad, so at this point we're pretty sure it's going to be my son that will take over for me. Um, if he doesn't have any kin, the clan mothers will go Clan mothers and, and elders. Uh, uh, she vote. They, they'll, they'll the, vote. The clan mothers vote. Clan mothers. They select right. the Mostly the clan successor. mothers. What a clan mother does is when a child is born and we have an elderly chief, 
she watches all the children, and she will be able to pick out the child who would be the best leader at a very young age, but they would not say anything because they need to continue to watch that child. It takes a village to raise a child. That's true to today, you know? Hey, aunt, can you watch my kids? Hey, grandma, can you watch my kids? It takes a village, and it still does. So, yeah, that's how it goes. I forgot where I was going with that. Well, yeah. just pretty much, of the, you know, how... <laughs> Oh, yeah, no. oh yeah. <laughs> Then at the age of accountability, which is the age of 13, he is taken into the woods, blindfolded. He sits on a stump. He cannot tell the other children that he's in the woods, blindfolded, alone. He cannot say a word to you, or he will never become a man. All night long, he hears the night's sounds and he's frightened, he can't see. And he can hear the twigs and the trees moving and he's frightened, he can't see. But when the sun came up, he lifted up his blindfold and there sitting beside him was his father. The moral to this story is, even in this life when you're blindfolded, you're okay because your heavenly father is right there on that stump next to you. Do they still do this? You know, this is what's stuff? being yes. lost. That's what's being lost. Yeah. Uh, I sure. made my, my grandfather made me do a vision quest. I was about, I guess I, I wasn't very old. I was only about 10, 12 when he told me that I was Native that, American. That, that young? Yeah. Vision he made me make my own prayer ties. Uh, I had no food, no water. Like she said, was blindfolded. And as she said, a funny thing that she had just said was funny was after all night is sitting there and shaking and and listening and wondering what was going on in the morning when I felt the sun come up and get warm on my back because all I had on at that time, you know, was like a, like a one cloth or a breech cloth. Breech cloth, yeah. And when I stood up and I undone blindfold, my grandfather sat across from me about 25 foot away on a down tree. <coughs> so most of the animal noises and stuff I heard all night was him. <laughs> and I said, why, grandfather? And I said, why, 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 grandfather? He says, well, I couldn't let the animal eat you, so the best thing I could do is like believe I was him. <laughs> A lot of people wonder how Native Americans always got their eagle feathers. They think we always had to climb the big mountain to get yeah, the eagle feather. A lot of people don't know this, but what we used to do, this is from my father who was Cherokee and Apache, is that down by the stream, turn around and find some rocks, build a little rack, put some grass on top of it, and put on top of it, and they stick, stand underneath that little rack, and they put fish on top of that rack. Eagle will come down, come get the fish. Well, the eagle comes down to get the fish. The young boy would grab his tail, grab his feather. There are some, there are some, there are some uh, reservations out in the reservation where there are sacred mountains where there are certain eagles which some warriors used to have to climb way before our generations and the generations to come. But that's usually how. You know, everybody used to think, oh, they got to climb all these big mountains just to get to that eagle's nest. We weren't as dumb as people thought we were. <laughs> <laughs> or if you were really lucky, you had an elder that said you're next in line to inherit these from the family. Yeah. <laughs> I, sorry, I forgot this. This is an arrowhead. I got out of the Lackawanna River, right down here. Oh, my God, yeah. This is one of my treasures. This is what I have in my medicine, one of my medicine bags anyway. But it's flint made into an arrowhead. I have polished it and I have kept it for years and years and years. 
quick little story. We were all at one of these Native American powwows we were doing one time for the public. And a young lady that had came asked if she could stay. And we, we allow it, sure, come on, stay, learn, pray, you know. It gets better at night. The more we do, the more you learn because it's our way of doing things at that time. And it shows <laughs> over when everybody's gone. We're praying for us, each other, and she comes up, oh, I guess, dusk, with a blanket like she was carrying, all wrapped up. She said, I fell into the creek, she said. She was a heavy set girl and says, I fell into the creek. I was trying to wash up a little bit, and when I came up, I came up with this. And she comes up with this beautiful, opens up this blanket, <coughs> and turns around and comes up with this beautiful stone bowl. Well, I mean, she's running around showing it to everybody, and I mean, we're, wow, what a find, you know? Well, as a couple hours go by, there was a guy claiming he was a chief, and he was this, and he was that. Well, this girl didn't know any better. She gives him the bowl because he wouldn't know what to do with it. Well, she left it wrapped in the blanket, and his hands in the bowl. By the time he gets back up to where we call the dance circle, and he's going to show somebody, as he opened up the blanket, it caught fire. <laughs> and this is no lie, there was, a, there was a couple hundred people standing around. The blanket caught fire, the stone was red hot. There was a big singe mark on the blanket where they had had it folded over. And at that point is when we had sent clan mothers and grandmothers and stuff back to him to take this back, turn it back into the water where it was found. You know, at that point, because it did you into the wrong hands. <laughs> <laughs> True story, you know, I you talk about Tom, did you have a question? Yeah. A comment. Uh, we've never seen an Indian with a beard. <laughs> That's because you got it from his mother's side. Because you always see <laughs> those Indians on TV. <laughs> That's because you always mostly see your your uh, Italian Indians on TV. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Native Americans never shave, so they never force the hair to be grown on the face of the white man. Uh, <coughs> you've never seen a bearded Indian. But as, did, as, they usually weren't thick. As the time has gone by, uh, mixture of mixture generations, generations and, and blood. I grow a beard. You're sure you're not afraid of heights? Not at all. I worked high steel for... We jumped out of a few helicopters and planes, well, believe me. Yeah, I probably <laughs> worked high of steel out of Philadelphia and New York for about 15, 20 years. Wow. Yes, ma'am. Mohawks were the best linemen there was in New York City. Mm -hmm. I worked Even for a lot of Mohawks. I, I didn't work there. Huh? Yeah. I yep. didn't work there. Uh, in fact, the, the last ball. big job I did was I put in a big water tree.